everyone, thanks for joining. Hey everyone, thanks for joining. Um, I'm Andre from Grumman. I'll be presenting this webinar on serverless resilience. So before we really get into it, I just want to start up a quick survey. And this isn't something that you necessarily have to answer. It's something you could just think about as we're going through the presentation. But if you do have an answer or you want to share your experience, feel free to enter in the chat box. So first one, if you're using a serverless application or you've ran a serverless application or you tested with serverless, whatever it might be, have you ever have it? Have you ever had it fail unexpectedly? If so, what did you do to fix and prevent the issue? And then once that was done, are you confident that your application can handle failure in the future? Now, if you're lucky and you haven't had a serverless application fail, um, first of all, congratulations. Second of all, I'm sorry to say that it's only a matter of time before it does fail. Um, and that's not something that you're doing wrong. That's just the nature of systems that we run today. My hope with this presentation is that you'll get some ideas about how you can stay ahead of failures so you can see, keep your systems running reliably. And as Marissa mentioned, my name's Andre. I'm a product specialist at Gremlin. Uh, my job is really simple. I help SREs, developers, testers, engineers, folks in tech make their systems more reliable by providing them with the tools and knowledge to do so. Topics like chaos engineering, reliability engineering are incredibly important to me and to us at Gremlin, uh, especially as more and more companies are becoming cloud native and moving to these complex systems. So my goal in this webinar isn't really to showcase a specific product, but to share some ideas and thoughts and practices on how we can apply these practices, these reliability practices to serverless platforms. So a quick look at our agenda. I'll start by kind of setting the baseline of what reliability and resiliency are and what serverless is. I'll jump into how serverless platforms can fail. Then I'll move into what is chaos engineering, explain a bit about how it works. We'll talk about how to apply chaos engineering practices to serverless. And then I'll conclude with a, a quick recap and a, if you jump into Q&A. So let's start with the absolute basics. What is reliability? Now, reliability is the ability for a system to remain available, or in other words, how dependable the system is. Um, this is often used interchangeably with resiliency, but there is a slight difference. Resiliency is the ability for a system to quickly recover from adverse conditions. And the difference that we try to point out is that reliability is the end goal, and resiliency is how we achieve that goal. So in other words, by implementing ways that make our systems more resilient, by making them able to recover from situations faster or incidents faster uh, leads us to greater reliability. And I think we can all agree that reliability is important, but really why is it important, right? Why should engineers focus their time and effort on improving reliability when they can be doing cool stuff like developing new features? Well, the big one that we hear about all the time is of course, downtime. Unreliable systems break, and this usually means an interruption in service. This in turn can lead to lower revenue due to lost sales, right? If you rely on your application to generate income, you get uh, customers who are angry or frustrated that they can't use your service. You have engineers who are exhausted because they're spending all their time in emergency response mode, you know, working late hours or over weekends to fix a problem. Now this time spent fixing problems is time that you could have spent doing valuable stuff like feature development um, or handling customer tickets. Down, downtime isn't just an expense, it's also a missed opportunity cost. And then lastly, you slow down your ability to create and turn around new software since you're dedicating this valuable time and resources towards fixing rather than creating. And these stakes and costs get higher depending on the size of your application and the industries that you're in. For example, an online store might lose a few thousand dollars per hour of downtime, but downtime for a bank or a hospital or an airline could actually cost lives. So it's important to tie that cost to the size of your business and to the size of your industry. The problem, as we all know, is that no system is perfect, right? Failures happen all the time, even in systems that are designed to be quote unquote failure proof. And these failures are caused by unknown, uh, unknown variables in our systems. You know, even the most thoughtfully designed systems can't account for every possible scenario. And complexity makes this problem worse. Right? The more complex the system is, the more likely it is to contain failure modes or ways of failing that we're not aware of. Now, unfortunately, modern systems are only getting more complex by the day. And on top of that, our companies are always looking for ways to increase development velocity, right? We need to move faster, we need to develop features faster, test faster, push the customers faster, fix bugs faster. You know, we have that real competitive need and these systems are working to enable that, but that velocity means that uh, failures are more likely to creep in. So not only are systems and applications becoming more complex, 
they're also constantly changing and we're changing them faster than ever before. So how can we possibly improve liability with there's so much chaos going on? And I think a good way to illustrate this is to look at an example of an application that a lot of us have probably worked in or at least know about. Um, so Kubernetes is something that I talk about a lot. It's something that I really enjoy myself, but if it could go without saying that it's really hard to learn and it's really hard to get right, especially when you're starting off. So just as a quick recap, um, in Kubernetes, we have multiple different components that are working together. We have these worker nodes that are the gray boxes here that are running pods, which contain our applications. We also have the control plane, which is basically the brain of the cluster, right? It maintains cluster state. Uh, it might redirect traffic or do load balancing and things like that. And if we're running this on a cloud platform, we might have an integration with a cloud provider through an API or so. Now, each of these components on its own has its own set of failure modes, right? We have like the infamous uh, pod crash loop back off, node failures, network outages, network latency. We could even have a cloud provider outage or a control plane outage. Now, in addition, there are failure modes in how these components interact with each other. So for example, if we have a, no a worker node fail, then all of the pods and applications that we're running on that node will also fail. In when that happens, we need the control plane to detect it so that it can report this up to our cloud platform and then start redirecting traffic to a healthy node. All, right, all this happens, this whole domino effect happens because of one component failing. And every step that we add to that, every component that we add to the system introduces additional risk of failures and additional risk of unknown variables and things failing. Now, this isn't to knock on Kubernetes, but Kubernetes is great at what it does. And when set up with high availability, it really can be rock solid, but it does have a lot of moving parts. And these parts can fail in unexpected ways if we don't proactively root out and address them. So this leads into our next slide, which is all about serverless. So again, just as a quick recap, serverless platforms that you deploy and run applications without having to provision, configure, or manage infrastructure. As a developer, you can basically upload your code to the platform and the platform handles the rest. The great thing about this is developers don't need to think about nodes, networking, replicas, or even containers, really. They just need to take their code, push it up, and it gets deployed for them automatically. Now, this is great in theory, but it does pose a reliability challenge. So the great thing about serverless platforms is that they separate the infrastructure from the applications, and they reduce the workload for developers. The problem is that something has to manage that code, right? Something needs to handle converting that code into an actual deployable executable. So this means having additional software on top of your existing stack that can manage that for you, right? Which is your serverless platform. Now adding this layer, like adding any sort of layer adds complexity. And if you remember from a few minutes ago, more complexity means more risk of something going wrong and something failing. So when we talk about serverless reliability, we're not just talking about building reliable applications, right? Developing reliable code, but also building a reliable serverless platform for that code to run on. Because you can imagine if the platform fails, what the, con what the consequences will be for the applications that we have running on it. And I feel like the best way to illustrate this is with an actual serverless platform. And I'm going to pick on native for this webinar. Uh, Native is a really fantastic serverless platform that runs on top of Kubernetes. It makes it super simple to take a container and deploy it onto Kubernetes without having to worry about uh, setting up really complicated networking rules, really in-depth resource allocation rules, or a lot of the other typical boilerplate you usually have to do when creating a Kubernetes manifest, right? like deployments and replicas and all that fun stuff. Basically, you just tell Native what image you want to run, what network ports to open, maybe a few other optional parameters, and it handles the rest. And there are two main components to native if you're familiar with it, but the one we'll be focusing on today is called native serving, because this is the one that actually handles deploying and managing serverless applications. Um, and so we're going to take a look at some of the ways native serving in particular can theoretically fail and how we might want to mitigate that risk. And so knowing what we know about native and Kubernetes, we can pinpoint really four key areas where reliability is a concern. First is the application itself. Right? This is the workload, the serverless workload that developers are deploying to and running on native. Next is native itself, specifically native serving, which is the component that actually runs our applications. 
Third is the Kubernetes cluster that native is running on. And last but not least is the cloud platform or on-prem infrastructure or standalone server, basically the hardware and environment that our Kubernetes cluster is running on. And if we look at these layers a bit more closely, or if we think about them a bit more, we can start to identify areas of ownership. We know the application owner is owned almost exclusively by developers, while the native and Kubernetes layers are owned more by SREs. Now, the environment or cloud platform can be owned by SREs or operations teams or a cloud provider, depending on where we're running a cluster. And this idea of ownership will become more relevant in the next slide. So if you think about how different teams interact with native, we kind of start to see a picture of how reliability plays into the overall system. Uh, in this case, we'll just ignore the contributors for now. No offense to them, they do great work. But for just for this webinar, we're gonna focus on the users, the developers, and the operators. What do users want? They want the application to be usable and accessible. That's it. They don't care about native or Kubernetes or whether you're running in the cloud or on-prem. You could be running your application on a smartwatch for all they care, as long as it's uh, responsive and reliable. That's what matters to users. For developers, they're more interested in their application stability. Right? The underlying platform is mostly irrelevant, just as long as it's reliable and they can easily deploy to it and they can quickly address any problems with their applications. And operators and SREs care mostly about the systems that they manage. Right? They, might, they might not even know or care about the applications themselves, but they do care about providing that reliable platform, that reliable foundation for developers to build on. That's mostly because they know that if something does go wrong, if something fails, they're most likely to get the blame for it failing, and they're most likely to have to get involved and get their hands dirty in resolving it. And the reason I'm taking so much time to call out the fact that different teams own different parts of the stack is because ultimately, reliability is a shared responsibility. In other words, it doesn't fall under one single role. It's not just an SRE thing or an ops thing or a developer thing or a system administrator thing. Everyone needs to participate in setting reliability targets, monitoring for issues, and fixing, or rather identifying and addressing these failure modes when they come up. For developers, it's pretty clear cut, right? Merkin are making your applications resilient. You know, fix critical bugs in your code, add things like exception handling, retries, and timeouts to any network calls your application makes, and use really any other techniques at your disposal to make your code as bulletproof as you possibly can. SREs, your job is to keep the serverless platform up and running for developers. Right? If you are using native, learn the best practices for high availability native and Kubernetes clusters. Learn how to configure things like redundancy, monitoring, logging. Make sure you read up on best practices and even horror stories from other teams and organizations to learn what issues could happen and what to look out for. The more you know before going into production, the better. But in some cases, you just need to move fast and get it out there. So it's still important to make sure that you're constantly keeping up to date with the latest practices and techniques for reliability so that you can keep your systems running and stay ahead of issues. For ops teams and SREs, you're dependent, or rather the organization depends on you to keep the lights on and to provide the hardware and resources that the developers need to build resilient systems. Right? Make sure that your systems are redundant and fault tolerant, that you're able to stay ahead of things like capacity requirements, and that you swap out any failing or near failing components. And there are a few things that everyone needs to take part in across the organization. First is being able to collaborate on creating service level objectives. Now service level objectives are SLOs, define the standard or service that customers should expect from your service or your application. This is especially important because SLOs aren't just a technical objective, right? They're not just like uptime or latency or any individual metric. Rather, they're a business objective. All right, SLOs are used to define service level agreements or SLAs. And depending on how your business defines SLAs, failing to meet them could have financial or even legal ramifications. Right? Nobody, especially engineering, wants finance or legal on their back because it took like one minute or two minutes too long to restore service. So make sure that you're aware of your objectives and you're taking measures to satisfy them, regardless of whether you're developing or uh, maintaining your platform. And on the same note, be aware of your error budgets. Sorry, error budgets. 
an error budget is the maximum amount of downtime that is allowed for your systems before you violate your SLOs. And in a sense, they're kind, it's easier to think of them as cash or as money, right? You start each month or year or SLO period with a certain amount and you pay it back for each moment of downtime, but it doesn't roll over. So if you have extra error budgets, consider using it to try different things. Maybe test out new resiliency measures, um, run reliability tests, maybe run some CAS experiments. Uh, you are paying out of your error budget in case something goes wrong or something goes down, but the error budget provides that sort of buffer to make sure that you don't violate your SLAs, uh, but you're still able to try new things and innovate and try and make your systems more resilient. Again, error budgets goes beyond a single team. So if you do start a resiliency initiative or reliability initiative that could affect the error budget, get everyone involved first. All right, so we talked about what reliability and resiliency are, what serverless is, and some of the challenges of making serverless reliable and why reliability is so important. So next let's dive into how you can actually test, validate, and improve reliability. And we're gonna be doing this by going over a method called chaos engineering. So if you're not familiar, the idea behind chaos engineering is that it's a practice. It's thoughtful, controlled experiments that are designed to reveal weaknesses or failure modes in our systems. And chaos engineering really developed as a practice about 10 years ago in enterprise environments like Amazon and Netflix. These companies needed a way to test their system's ability to withstand turbulent and unfavorable conditions like random system failures and region outages. Of course, just going into a data center and pressing the power button on a server or cutting a fiber optic cable is really bad and really destructive. So they built these tools to help simulate these conditions. If you've heard of tools like Chaos Monkey, Gremlin, Litmus, Chaos Mesh, this is what they were all born out of, right? This idea of being able to test these honestly kind of destructful conditions in a safe, controlled way. And that's why we kind of approach it with this scientific process in mind, right? Because it has the actual impact to affect our systems, we need to make sure that we're really thoughtful and considerate about how we go about this. So if you look at the general process of how chaos engineering works, we start by creating a hypothesis, right? It's an assumption about um, if we inject this type of failure, if we create this type of failure, this is going to be the outcome that we would expect to see on our systems. So it's kind of a cause and effect thing. And the important thing when you're creating your first hypothesis or when you're starting out with cast engineering is to start small, right? Don't go with a example like, uh, what happens if I shut down an entire production region or an entire production data center? Right? Maybe it starts with what happens if I increase CPU usage on this one server by 15%, right? How does that affect the performance of my application? So when we say start small, just start with the basics, uh, be able to observe the impact and make uh, conclusions, but without actually creating a severe impact on your systems. So once you have your hypothesis, you then test your systems to isolate issues and to mitigate risk. And we say that you should do this progressively because again, you start out small. Maybe you add 15% CPU usage to a server and uh, see something come out of that, a performance issue come out of that. You can then bump up that experiment to use 20 or 25% CPU and then observe the issues coming out of that. And then you're able to see that based off of CPU usage, how that impacts your systems. And having that sort of progressive leap helps you isolate issues better. And again, you know, you gradually increase that magnitude, which is essentially the severity of the experiment and scale it up. So maybe instead of consuming 25% CPU on one server, you consume it on two or three, or even across an entire cluster, just to get a better idea of what that performance impact would be. While you're doing this, make sure to observe, document, and share the results with your team. Right? This isn't just one engineer doing these tests, it's really everybody, and everybody has the potential to learn from it. So as you identify more issues with your systems, and you learn more about how they work through these experiments, you know, make sure to document your findings and share them with your fellow engineers. That way everybody can learn together. And ultimately what this leads to is more resilient systems, which leads to greater reliability, which leads to better customer experiences.
And it's a cycle of test, fix, verify, and tweak that really gives chaos engineering its power and its popularity. And so with experiments, you have a lot of flexibility in how you might approach them, right? There's not really a fixed set of experiments that you might want to run. It really depends on your platform and your applications. So just some examples of experiments or hypothesis that you might come up with for a serverless is what happens to your application when memory usage reaches 100%? How does adding 20 milliseconds of network latency to all network traffic or a certain type of network traffic impact the user experience? Does your application remain available if you terminate one of your working nodes, right? If you're uh, shutting down a server that has serverless applications running on it, do those applications get migrated to another node? Or maybe if you have replicas already running on a, another node, does traffic load balance over successfully? And again, if you lose a node or some part of your serverless platform, does the platform itself remain available? Right, That's the key thing when you're talking about running a serverless platform is that the platform itself needs to be tolerant to failure. Because if that goes down, then that will just have a cascading impact or a domino effect on all of your applications. And before I go on to the next slide, I will note that different chaos engineering tools support different types of experiments. So it depends on the tool that you're using and even the platform that you're running on. Um, some cloud platforms don't allow certain types of experiments and that's just a security thing. Um, but this is just to give you a general idea of how you can approach experimentation. Generally speaking, you have a lot more power and a lot more flexibility over what types of experiments you run when you're running the serverless platform yourself, as opposed to using a cloud platform provider. So just to get into the weeds a bit, let's walk through one possible experiment. So to set the baseline, one of the most important aspects of distributed platforms like Kubernetes and like native is that they can maintain a minimum number of container or pod replicas. So if we deploy a serverless application with at least one minimum replica and all of our replicas fail a crash, native should detect this and automatically deploy a new replica. That becomes a hypothesis. And what we would expect is that this will happen in a few seconds at most and automatically. So zero intervention required from developers, SREs, or operators. So if we translate this into an actual experiment, we'll say, when we terminate all of our application pods and we monitor native or whatever observability tool that we're using to monitor Kubernetes in native, we'll be able to see our application terminate and then come back up automatically without any intervention. And we can even set a success message, uh, success metric for this, right? So we consider it a successful test if native automatically deploys a new replica with minimum downtime. And this can be, let's say 30 seconds. So this proves to us that we can trust native to keep our application resilient in a live environment and not significantly impact customers. And we can test this even in pre-production. So let's say we have our serverless platform up and test or staging or QA or whatever environment you call it. You can use your chaos engineering tool to run this experiment to actually terminate one of your nodes or your application pods. Keep an eye on your observability tool to make sure that they come back up. And since you've already tested this in pre-production, you can feel confident that if you happen to lose your pods in production, that native will be able to jump in and bring them back up for you. Now, if this fails, if it doesn't meet our hypothesis, you do need to pinpoint the root cause so that you can implement a fix. The good thing is that once the fix is in, you can then repeat this experiment to verify that it works. And if it does work, or once it does eventually work, once your fixes are effective, you can trust that that fix will also work in production and that it will be able to keep your applications running, even if some of your replicas were to fail. And as long as our cluster is relatively stable, as long as it remains generally the same, we can feel confident that our application will keep working. But again, modern systems, excuse me, modern systems don't remain stable forever. They change settings and configurations and applications change. So we might want to periodically repeat this experiment to make sure that our applications always remain resilient, even as we deploy new code or scale them up or scale them down or whatever it might be. 
And just to come up with some other ideas of other experiments, tests you can run, uh, this isn't an exhaustive list, but hopefully it gives you some good ideas or helps you start to think about some of the types of scenarios that you run into. If you think about on the application layer as a developer, you know, can our application scale quickly and can it scale consistently? If you run an experiment where we consume extra CPU or RAM within our application itself or within the container or the pod or whatever it might be and see that it's still responsive. Does our application automatically restart after it crashes? Well, we can run something like a uh, pod shutdown or a pod crash and observe our application or native to make sure that another pod gets deployed to replace it. Also, are our health checks working the way we expect them to? We can test this by blocking network traffic to the endpoint that we're using for health checks. And then we'll see if native or Kubernetes detects that that health check isn't responding or that it's failing and restarts our application automatically. You know, if we're on the platform team, we might look into experiments like, is our Kubernetes or native cluster highly available? Well, we can test this by shutting down or <clears throat> dropping network traffic to one of the nodes in our control plane. Remember, a control plane is responsible for maintaining the state of the cluster. So if the cluster is highly available, losing one of those nodes shouldn't take the cluster down. Next is, is our monitoring or observability set up correctly? We can test this by consuming CPU or RAM across several of our nodes. Maybe we add network latency or we terminate certain workloads. Regardless of whatever it might be, it's changing the state of our cluster. And so if we watch our monitoring tools, our dashboards, and our alerts, we'll be able to make sure that those are set up correctly to track the uh, metrics that are relevant for us. And also, can we scale our cluster without impacting our applications? And when I say scaling, I don't just mean scaling up, right? It's not just adding nodes to increase capacity. It's also scaling down to save money or to reduce your capacity if you don't need it. Um, and scaling down could result in applications like serverless applications actually being terminated. We don't mean them to. So we wanna make sure that if we add a worker node by consuming CPU or RAM to trigger auto scaling, or we terminate a worker node to scale back down, that none of those actually impacts our applications in a noticeable way. And lastly, when we think about our infrastructure, the actual environment or the foundation that all of this is running on, um, is our infrastructure redundant? Well, let's shut down a worker node in our cluster or zone or region and see that our applications keep running. Is our zone or region failover set up correctly? Right? Let's say we have a disaster recovery plan where if one of our zones fails, we fall over to a, um, a backup zone. Well, we can test this by dropping network traffic to our primary zone, to our entire primary zone, and see if our traffic load balances to our backup zone. And then this is actually a non-technical test, but again, non-technical tests are something that we can test with chaos engineering. So it's important to include them. You know, we can test whether or not our incident response runbooks are up to date. The way we do this is by reproducing an incident that we might've experienced in the past and then have our team respond to it as if it was a real incident. So for example, um, a zone outage is something that a lot of teams need to prepare for. They need to have a runbook or a plan to respond to. We can repeat our zone failover test by dropping network traffic to our primary zone and then have our engineers actually debug and troubleshoot and respond to that as if it was a real incident. And at Gremlin, we actually call these game days. It's a game, uh, moment where you bring your entire team together or a specific team together to run experiments and actually um, observe and treat them as a team to be able to learn and practice how to respond to similar incidents if they happen in production. Uh, but there are also what we call fire drills, which are essentially game days, but where the team isn't actually notified, right? They actually treat it as if it was a real issue. And that's a more surefire way, no pun intended, to verify that your incident response runbooks are working. Um, but it's also a bit more chaotic. So you just need to find that balance depending on how comfortable your team is with running these type of tests. And many of these tests aren't specific to Kubernetes and native either. 
Like for example, health checks and auto restart policies also apply to other container runtimes and orchestration tools, cloud platforms, infrastructure automation tools, and monitoring tools. And I know that all of this might seem daunting at first, thinking of all these different possible scenarios for each of the layers of your stack. But as you start running these reliability tests and uncovering failure modes and making improvements and then validating the results, your risk of outages drops significantly. Your team becomes more comfortable when thinking about um, different types of failure modes and being able to respond to them effectively. So it doesn't just empower your engineers, it also makes your customers happier and your systems more resilient. So I know we covered a lot today, but if there's anything you should take away from this presentation, it's this. Reliable systems are those that we can trust to stay up and running. And the way that we achieve reliability is by making the systems more resilient. Or in other words, improving the system's resiliency leads to greater reliability. The more complex the system is, the higher its risk of failure. Serverless platforms add a layer between our applications and our infrastructure, which creates a lot of complexity, a lot of abstraction, and introduces a bunch of unknown variables, which makes it harder for us to account for the different types of failure modes. Chaos engineering tests reliability, or rather is a method of testing reliability by simulating unfavorable conditions like broken network connections, node failures, zone or region outages, and runaway processes. And by running chaos engineering experiments, we can verify that our serverless infrastructure from the applications to the platform down to the hardware itself is resilient to conditions that can impact it in the real world. This lets you get ahead of these problems so that they don't happen in production, which again, ultimately is to make your users happy. So that's the meat of my webinar. I wanna thank you all for joining me today. I hope this was informative. Um, again, my name is Andre Newman. I'm a product specialist at Gremlin. Feel free to say hi to me on Twitter or shoot me an email. I'm always up for chatting about reliability systems and just geeking out over tech trends in general. And since that concludes my webinar, we can get started with Q&A. Uh, feel free to answer any questions in the Q&A box and I'll be happy to answer them. Andre, we've got a couple questions in. Uh, the first one is, does Google Cloud Run allow running these serverless chaos experiments? I can't say specifically for Google Cloud Run. Um, I don't believe that they have their own chaos engineering tool or fault injection tool, um, but there are some uh, chaos engineering tools out there that can actually inject these type of faults on the application level. So in this case, instead of running it on Google Cloud Run, you would you know, deploy your application to Cloud Run and then inject like a, a unhandled exception or application latency directly into your code. So that is an alternative that will work across different providers or even just on really any sort of system or platform, um, but it depends on the chaos engineering tool. Okay. What tools let you do serverless testing? So again, I can't really speak to specific tools, but there are tools out there that can inject faults into applications as well as the platform itself. Um, you just kind of have to see the different platforms that they support. Uh, the good thing about the platform-based tools is that some of them will let you use your cloud provider's API, so some of them can actually hook into like AWS or Google Cloud or Azure. Um, but we're also seeing that some providers are providing their own chaos engineering tools. So like. AWS has a tool where you can inject fault into some of their services, and I believe Azure does too, or they're coming out with one. Um, but there are also a bunch of chaos engineering projects that are sponsored by the CNCF, or there are CNCF projects that you click into that might support some of those cases too. Okay, great. Um, Malcolm's asking, how seamlessly does Gremlin integrate with Azure? So, we're more of a platform-based product. Essentially, as long as you're running a virtual machine instance or Kubernetes or a container runtime like Docker or Container D, you'd be able to use Gremlin. Uh, with our product specifically, we use agents to, um, to inject our actual failure. Um, and those agents can really only run on those platforms for now anyways. We're looking into ways to better support serverless. Uh, but as long as you're running a virtual machine instance or a Kubernetes or a Docker or something similar, then Gremlin will be able to integrate with it. 
Okay, great. And a question from Anoop. When should we start chaos engineering in a product development life cycle? Ooh, that is a great question. Um, the short answer is as soon as you have something deployed into a running environment. So let's say you have code that you put into a test or staging environment um, and you're able to run like your integration test on it, that's when you should run chaos engineering tool. That way you're able to, you know, you know, in short, you want to be able to get your systems in a position where it's as production-like as possible so that you get more accurate results that could better reflect production. So even if you have just like a basic testing or QA environment, uh, you can get in there and start running cast experiments and then start learning about how your system responds to those experiments so you can make those changes in production. You know, ultimately, the goal is to run cast experiments in production, which I know is a terrifying concept for a lot of engineers, um, including me. I've done engineering in the past and QA in the past. So, but ultimately, production is where your customers are. It's where you'll get the most realistic and the most relevant results. So my recommendation is start as early as you can and move as far right into the process as you can. OK, great. And from Vijay, the uh, Gremlin ecosystem only as software as a service model, or can it be on-prem too? Uh, we are only SaaS right now. We do offer ways to better support on-prem. Like we know that if you're running on prem, you might have really strict firewall rules. So we do what we can to support that from a security perspective. Uh, but as far as being able to actually use our tool and run experiments, it's SaaS only. Okay, great. And what do you do about serverless platforms that you don't control, like AWS Lambda? Honestly, there's not much that you can do. You're kind of at the mercy of the platform provider. Um, the good news is that most, if not all, platform providers are also interested in reliability because they know that if your systems go down, you might migrate away from them and they don't want to lose that money. So they'll often provide tips and resources or even frameworks for being able to better handle failures on your own. Like, for example, um, AWS has their well-architected framework that includes the entire section on reliability and covers things like setting up redundancy, planning for disaster recovery, setting reliability goals and improving reliability for their own tools and services. So basically, you know, do what you can with your own app, with your own code and your own applications, um, and then check with your provider to see if there's anything that they can do to help you become more resilient on their platform. Okay, and from Malcolm, <clears throat> do you have any leadership focused videos on why they want to get started with chaos engineering containing a low risk, high reward story that can sell the sizzle of CE while laying out the roadmap so that they can get started in a low risk manner. Well, there's a lot to that question. Uh, I just need a second to digest that. Um, I will say that we have a bunch of videos on our YouTube channel. If you want to check it out, um, youtube.com slash Grumman Inc, I believe is a URL. Um, we do have a lot of talks that we offer on the principles and practices of chaos engineering. Uh, and some of those talks do involve our own customers and folks who have used our product in a, like an enterprise environment. Um, so that might be helpful for you. I uh, can't think of a specific video that we have that would highlight that. Um, but if you check our website, we also have um, some case studies with our customers that could also help with that. I right, see so you're looking for a series of three minute videos. Um, in that case, our case studies might be helpful for you. If you go to our website, grumman.com, there might be information there that you could use. Okay, so anybody else has any questions for Andre, you can put them in the chat or the Q&A.
Andre, you do have another question in here about showing a demo using Gremlin. Probably can't show a demo here, but if you do want to see our product, you can go to gremlin.com slash demo dash center, um, or just go to our website and you'll be able to find a bunch of demo videos there. Uh, again, we also post those on YouTube. So if you go to our YouTube channel, you can find them there too. I did see a question come up on recommended resources for fundamental Kubernetes learning. Um, I personally recommend the Kubernetes documentation site. It has a ton of great info there. I know it's a lot, but um, once you're able to kind of go through it, they also provide like just getting started and basic materials there too, and training courses. Uh, I would recommend getting hands on with it. At least that's the best way for me to learn. Um, but yeah, definitely check out Kubernetes website and they have a lot of great resources there. Okay, amazing. Well, thank you so much, Andre, for your time today. And thank you everyone for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be up on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page. Thank you so much. And we hope that you will join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.